Good to be with you tonight. I, I obviously went too long last night. They got a battery in the clock, so, so I <laughs> had to get that fixed. Amen. And I knew the sun wouldn't stay out. It looks like Connecticut again out there this evening, so but I can't complain too much. My wife gets a hurricane about 2 a.m. this morning coming through our place, so if you don't know what a hurricane is, it's just a tornado. It's about 200 miles wide. That's, that's, that's what a what a hurricane is. But anyway, great to hear congregational singing. Just appreciate you lifting up your voices and singing praise to the Lord and the special music that magnifies Jesus. That is a blessing as well. Uh, some of you were not here last evening and, and you're here this evening. So let me uh, just say hello to all of you from uh, Brother Tom, Sister Bonnie, Benson and, and they send their love and thank you for their prayers and they've been a, a, as much a blessing to us as they were to you for all those years and, and we're happy to have them down this way. And Brother Mike and I were talking before service, uh, the first time I, I came up here to preach, th this is what a, uh, what a bad manager I have, was in February and you were meeting in the, in the, uh, hall, uh, the hall across the road over there and uh, stayed in the, in the RV, Brother Mike had an RV, and uh, stayed in that and was looking out the window over there and wondering how can pollen fall from trees that have no leaves on them? And I was 30, I think I was 38 years old and had never seen snow fall out of the sky. And the first time I ever saw snow was right across the road over there. And that was enough. I don't, don't ever need to <laughs> see it again. But people don't, People don't, uh, uh, well, they, they retire in Buffalo and they don't move north. They, they move south. And it's, it's miserable down where we are. That humidity, that heat is miserable. But you never hit a, hat, a patch of hot and slide off the road into a telephone pole. And, nor do you have to shovel it to get out of the house or, or any of that. So anyway, but it's, it's a joy to be here. Been doing this since I guess what, uh, 90, 94 maybe. A long, long, long time. It's always a blessing to come this way. Acts chapter number 16 tonight. Acts chapter 16. A story that you know and, and yet maybe a little, a little twist on it that'll be uh, an encouragement to your heart this evening. Acts chapter number 16, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help me, please. Uh, I want to honor your son. I want to honor your word. I want to be a blessing to the people that have come, and I, I can only do that if you will help me, and I pray that you would. And Father, the, those who are here tonight that know you as their Savior and have known you for a long, long time, I pray they would get a blessing. And if there's someone here tonight that's never trusted Christ as Savior, never known the great joy of sins forgiven and the assurance of eternal life, I pray you would speak to that heart this evening in Christ's name and amen. Acts chapter 16, verse number six, the Bible says, now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So here's the situation. God the Creator became man, born of a virgin. He lived without sin and then laid down his life and died upon the cross to pay for your sins and for mine. Three days and three nights later, he rose from the dead. That happened in, in one place. It happened on a, on a hill outside a city called Jerusalem. He was crucified there. He was buried not far from that spot, rose again and ascended back to heaven, all within a very, very small uh, part of, the, uh, of this, this world in which we live. And so uh, that death was for all sinners and that resurrection was for all those that need to be saved. But how could something that happened in that one place be known to everyone in the world? Well, the people that saw it happen, the people who are eyewitnesses were commissioned, given the responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a great big world and there's only a few of them. And so some men went north and some men went south and some went east and some went west. And, and Paul, one of those men, and, and Silas with him, one of those men, they said, well, let's go this direction. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them because someone else was already going that way. 
And they said, well, let's go to this town. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them because someone else was already going to that town. So, so the, these few believers trying to reach the entire world were very dependent upon the direction of the Holy Spirit, not just to tell them where to go, but to tell them where not to go. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to duplicate somebody else's work when there's a, a whole city over here that has never heard the gospel. And so, as 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 the Lord said, no, you can't go there. They didn't give up. You can't go there. They didn't give up. You can't go there. They didn't give up. Finally, they get this clear direction from the Lord. A man of Macedonia says, "Come, come over into Macedonia and help us." You talk about clear direction. That's clear direction. And what a, what a blessing to have, have the Lord speak so evidently and revealing His will. And look what the Bible says. And after, verse 10, after he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Now, some people say, I wish I could preach like Paul. We've never heard Paul preach. Some people say, I wish I had the talent, the ability that Paul had. You really don't know how much talent, how much ability Paul did have. I'll tell you what Paul had. When God told him to do something, he got on it immediately. He didn't, he didn't waver, he didn't doubt, he didn't argue, he didn't sit around and, and, and wait for this man of Macedonia uh, to, to grow old and die. When, when the Lord said, Macedonia, Paul said, let's get at it. And we can all, we can all be that. We, 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 none of us has the same intellect, none of us have the same talents, gifts, abilities. We don't even have the same opportunities. But I tell you what we can do, we can get with it. We can immediately endeavor to do what God has told us to do. And so that's what happened. He was sure, assuredly gathering. The Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. So let's say this. If God wants you to tell people about Jesus Christ, I'm certain that he does, and if you decide, I'm going to get at this right away, and I hope that you will, there are some things you'll have to leave behind. And Paul was willing to do that. I hope you're willing to do that. Loosing from Troas. We've been here long enough. Let's get moving. And they, they went to, they didn't know where in Macedonia they'd find this man. So they went to Philippi. That's where the most people were, most commerce, most, most trade. So let's try it there. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath... We went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. It was a resort, a riverside resort. And some women were there on, on, the, on the Lord's day, the Sabbath day, uh, the sixth, seventh day of the week, and they were out there uh, praying to God. And let me just say to you, if, if you, most of you are from, attend a Bible-believing church, and much of what we do as we make our way through the Bible is we see that, wow, religion is really messed up. Wow, so many false doctrines, so many false teachings, and we point them out to you and, and we explain them to you so that, that you can do right by the Bible instead of doing wrong by the teachings of man. But, but listen, there's a difference between taking the gospel to the world and teaching save people Bible truth in a church. Our job is not to go into all the world and turn Methodists into Episcopalians and turn Catholics into Baptists. Our, our mission is to go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and sometimes I think we are... We hinder ourselves when someone says, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Lutheran, I, I'm, I'm a Muslim, I'm this or I'm that. And we immediately think, well, I've got to convince them that every aspect of their religion that is wrong needs to be corrected and be right. You know something, in Acts chapter number eight, a man was worshiping God in Jerusalem. He just didn't know Jesus. And Paul didn't pre, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Philip didn't preach to him about the errors of his religion. He preached to him the one missing piece, Jesus Christ. 
In Acts chapter number 10, there's a man named Cornelius. He fears God. He prays to God. And when Peter went to his house and knocked on the door, he didn't say, listen, man, you got some, some your Roman religion, you got some stuff messed up. He said, no, let me tell you the one missing piece you don't have. And he preached to him, Jesus Christ. These women are by a riverside praying. Listen, who's more likely to get saved? Someone who goes to church because they believe in God or someone who doesn't? Someone who prays because they have faith in God or someone who doesn't? Don't let the fact that someone is religious but of a different religion than you are turn you off or trap you into an argument or a debate about this church versus that church. You've already got a head start. They believe in God. Show them what God did for them. And that's, that's what happens here by this riverside. The Bible says a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, so she heard the gospel, she believed the gospel. We know from the early chapters in Acts, he wouldn't have baptized her if she wasn't a believer. And, and her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So praise the Lord. They travel to Philippi, they go down to this prayer meeting, they, they find these people who have faith in God but don't know Christ as Savior. They preach the gospel to them, they're saved and they are baptized. I had the joy when we were working many years ago uh, trying to get a church started in Thessalonica in Greece. We traveled one day down to Philippi and there is one waterway that flows through where, where the ancient city of Philippi stood and there's one uh, amphitheater left, one, one remnant of the town, and, and what a joy to be in what, what certainly was the very place where Paul preached to Lydia and baptized her, and it was really an, an exciting thing, and yet she can't be the man of Macedonia. Now, I know in modern society, maybe, maybe it'd be up for debate, but, but the man of Macedonia said, come, come over and help us. And Paul and Silas found this woman in her household and, and led them to Christ, praise the Lord. But, but they've come to town looking for a man that said, come help me. And thank the Lord for a good start in this city, but the job is not yet finished. So verse number 16, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by sooth saying, this poor girl has a devil in her. And the devil in her is able to, to give her the ability to, to do some fortune telling and some crystal ball reading and, and, and flip the tarot cards and, and all of that. Uh, but this poor girl, she's not getting wealthy uh, being used of the devil. Uh, she's being, being uh, used by the men who control her. They're getting wealthy uh, by, by dominating this poor girl. And the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This she did, uh, or this did she many days. But Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, all of us, if we went to a city to start a church, if we went to a city to win people to Christ, all of us would like to have people say, listen to these men, they're telling us the truth. But Paul showed us, Holy Spirit directing him, Paul showed us we don't need people who don't know Christ trying to help us do the work of Christ. We don't need someone in league with the devil participating in our ministries, even though they might be saying the right things. And so Paul doesn't just let this woman stay in bondage to this unclean spirit, even though she's promoting his ministry and, and telling others to, to listen to the way of salvation that he's, he's speaking. He, he commands that devil to come out of her. Praise the Lord. And he did. Thank the Lord. And so uh, what, what's important, and here's, here's one what you gather from this tonight, in your witnessing or if you're visiting tonight and you're not a believer, this woman said the right things. This woman believed the right things. That's a great starting point. But she's still the property of an unclean spirit. 
She has to believe and receive the truth that she knows and the truth that she proclaims. I grew up in Sunday school. I thank the Lord for a daddy that took me to Sunday school. I grew up going to church. I thank the Lord for a mother uh, that took me to church. And I, I knew that Jesus died on a cross and rose again, just like I knew that George Washington was the first president and that the, 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 the Union soldiers defeated the Confederate soldiers in the Civil War. These were all facts that I, I never doubted or disputed. But there came a day in my life at the age of 19 that I had to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior because the knowledge that I had about Jesus, as correct as it was, hadn't saved my soul. I had to be born again. And so that's what happens here with this woman. So now we've got, we've got someone else added to the company. And yet, verse 19, when the masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Many pastors here tonight, thank you for being here. Youth workers here tonight, thank you for being here. Street preachers and, and door knockers and track passers here tonight, thank you for being here. Some of you have, have been to the mission field or praying about going to the mission field. God, God found two men that wanted to see souls saved. And God directed two men to a, to a very specific place, Philippi in Macedonia, because they wanted to see souls saved. And they're preaching the gospel like God wants them to do. And some people are getting saved in, in response to the preaching. And, and the devil's being put on the run. He's, he's cast out of this woman. Everything's going great. <laughs> and then they ran right into a wall. They were arrested for no good reason. They were arraigned on false charges. That hurts. Hurts your reputation. It hurts your momentum. If you're not careful, it'll rob you of your, well, what did we read? They were assuredly, they, they were certain God wanted them to go to Macedonia. And when people are getting saved, of course, this is where God wants us. And when, when the devil's being cast out as a woman, of course, this is where God wants us. Well, are you as sure when a band of men are putting the handcuffs on you? Are you as sure when a bunch of liars are hauling you before the magistrate? That'll, that'll rock your world, won't it? God, I'm doing right. Why is this happening to me? God, I'm trying to serve you. Why is this happening to me? And the Bible says, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Really? One woman? One woman can't predict the winning horse at the races this Saturday? And you call that exceedingly trouble our city? Not a siege, not an invading army, not a pestilence, not a plague. Just two guys told the devil to get out of a woman. And he did. You know, people don't like the gospel. They really exaggerate about the amount of trouble and aggravation it causes them. They make such a big deal. We're well, trying to shove that thing down my throat. Actually, I just held it out with a smile on my face and gave you an opportunity to take it in your fingers. I, I, I wasn't, I, I, it would be problematic if I tried to shove it down your throat, but, I, but I'm not. We, we got this big old boy and he's just, he just, uh, he, he loves telling people about Jesus and he's out knocking on doors one afternoon not long ago and, and he went up the door and, and there's a sign that says, no soliciting. And he knocked on the door. And a woman opened the door and she said, can you not see that sign? And he said, I was confused because your doormat says, welcome. <laughs> so I didn't know, did, did you not want to talk to me or did you want to talk to me? Was I welcome or was I not welcome? Listen, no, it, it gets better. So she, she ran them off and they went down the driveway and, and they're going up the driveway to the next house and they hear a rattling and a commotion. She was taking the lid off the garbage can and throwing away the welcome mat. 
so the next Christian wouldn't be confused. <laughs> so. But it, it's, an ama- it's an amazing thing. We are not converting people at the edge of the sword. We are not burning their cities down if they don't join our religion. But when you just speak to somebody on the job, if you talk to them about a football game or you talk to them about politics or you talk to them about the weather, it's chit chat. And if you say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Don't be bothering me with that. What's, how did it escalate to that? And so they said, you exceedingly trouble our city. And then verse 20, 21, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe being Romans. They hadn't taught anybody anything. This woman's got an unclean spirit and she's following them around. They weren't pursuing her. They didn't go to her house. They didn't break into the, into the trailer with a neon light outside, palm reader. They, they, she's following them around and they just told the devil to get out of her. And they, they make up this whole great big lie. Now I've got a question for you. If there was a time in your life when you were exceedingly sure that the Lord wanted you to tell people about Jesus Christ and how they could be saved. And if there was a time in your life when you saw some people get saved and you saw God do some great things and you had some victories over the devil and, and you, were, you were absolutely sure this is the life God wants me to live. Since then, have people lying about you kind of put out your fire? Have people accusing you of things that weren't exactly true sort of dampened your zeal? Have, have you lost sight of the man of Macedonia because maybe you were mistreated? Paul and Silas were sure God wanted them to come to this town and help a man of Macedonia. And they haven't found him yet. And so being misrepresented and being arrested and being falsely accused and being lied about, thank God it didn't stop them. And the Bible says in verse number 22, and the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them. I've never been beaten for telling someone about Jesus. I imagine it's very painful. So they are, they're not being made fun of. They're not being told, get off my property. They're not having a piece of literature crumpled and thrown on the ground. They are being beaten with a rod. Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians 39 times. That man raised that stick and brought it down across their backs. That might make me want to quit. That might make you want to reconsider whether or not God had really sent you to that town. You know, you, 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 your last pastor, your, your current pastor, your next pastor, you men that are pastors, the man came before you and the men who come after you, all of us, all of us just had this idea that if I give my life to God and I serve God and I do what God wants me to do, everybody's going to be a Lydia. Nobody's going to be a magistrate. The, the, the people that hear me preach are going to get saved like the people down by the riverside. No, no mob's going to grab me and hold, hold me in the town square and treat me badly. And then it said, they didn't just beat them. They, they rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now, let, let, let me tell you something. This, this, I don't want this to offend you young people, but uh, my father taught me something that helps me understand this passage of scripture. Did you know that a beating can go through jeans and corduroy and almost any kind of fabric you can, uh, uh, (laughs) my dad taught me that. Um, Not verbally, it was his practical instruction. He, he, He showed me and left a lasting impression. They didn't take their clothes off, rip their clothes off of them so they would feel the force of the blow. They did it to humiliate them, to shame them, to embarrass them. 
You're gonna come to our town and preach your religion? You're gonna come to our town and tell people that your God is better than our God? We will tear your clothes off of you in the town square in front of everybody and you won't ever dare open your mouth again around here. Have you ever been humiliated? You ever have somebody just get in your face and just call you every, every name in the book? You ever have saved people you've poured your life into, turn around and rend you again? Have you, have you ever gone to the Lord in prayer and said, God, these, these people are, they're harming my wife, they're harming my children, they're harming my reputation. You gotta stop them and God didn't stop them. Here's what I wanna know. When you've been lied about and when you've been hurt and when you've been humiliated, do you forget about that man of Macedonia who needs your help? Are you still sure God wants you to find that man and tell him about Jesus? Or are you just gonna say, forget about it. I didn't know it was gonna cost me this much. Forget about it. I, I didn't know it was gonna, gonna go like this. You know, the reason, the reason God calls on us to walk by faith and not by sight, I've been saved 45 years. Some of you have been saved longer, some of you not as long, but the reason God calls upon you to walk by faith and not by sight, if he had shown you what was down the road, you wouldn't have taken it. If he had shown you everything you would encounter in your Macedonia, you wouldn't have got on that boat and gone there. And so he doesn't show you the future. He shows you the now. And he says, I, I sent you to this city. I want you to find a man of Macedonia. He wants your help. And look what happens. The Bible says, when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Your pastor is honorable. Your pastor works in the, in the prison house. And I, I don't want, I don't, when, when I go preach in the prisons, I, I thank God every time I hear those gates slam behind me as I leave. So don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want to spend one night in prison. I don't want to spend one night in jail. Don't get me wrong. Paul and Silas have not been taken to an air-conditioned, heated, lighted, sanitized American jail with three meals a day, internet, and a weight room. They are in a filthy, dirty place that hasn't been cleaned since it was established. It doesn't have running water, it doesn't have lights, it doesn't have sanitary air, it doesn't have any safety standards, OSHA doesn't even know it exists. And they, they take men whose backs have been torn open with a whip or a rod, throw them into the innermost part of that damp, dirty, smelly, filthy prison, force them down on the ground and chain them to the floor. And at that point, I just want to know if you, like me, wouldn't be saying, I must have missed the will of God. This couldn't possibly be what the Lord wants for my life. I wanted to live clean and I'm here in the dirt. Jesus saved me and pulled me out of the mire and now I'm chained in the mire. I came to this town to preach the gospel to lost people and here I am in this dark, dirty prison cell in the middle of the night. And the Bible says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. They didn't sing, woe is me. They didn't sing the blues. They didn't sing, why is this happening to such a great... They're singing praises to God. And through all of their pain and all their humiliation and all their confusion, it's, it's not muttered. It's not mumbled. 
They are, they are singing loud enough for the men in the cells up and down those hallways to hear their voices in the dark and they're praying so that they're, they're, they're talking to God, but they're talking to God, not, not trying to hide it. Wouldn't you think that if you got arrested, falsely charged, thrown in, in prison without a conviction, beaten, chained to the floor, might make you a little careful. I don't want to make these people any more upset. I've done everything else to me. They're liable to kill me if I say any more about Jesus. Oh, Silas turned to Paul and said, let's sing Hold the Fort. Paul turned to Silas, let's sing every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And they begin to sing praise to God. They begin to pray to God. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. <laughs> That's not your run of the mill earthquake. My guess, this is, this is Greece, Asia Minor. You've seen the earthquakes when they hit Turkey and Albania and those places. My guess would be just your ordinary earth shaking, the roof caves in. And everybody gets flattened. The walls fall down and everybody gets crushed. This earthquake, the foundations of the prison shake and the doors come open and the chains fall off the hands and feet of the prisoners. Seems to me like God's walking through that place. God's shaking that ground and hitting that door and hitting that door and hitting that chain and hitting that chain and here, here's, here comes the real miracle. The keeper of the prison awaking out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Wait a minute. My chains are off. The door to my cell is open. The door at the end of the hallway is open. I can see all the way to the courtyard and the door to the woods is open. But I'm not leaving. Because in all my life, in all my life, I've never known man to take a beating and get chained to a prison floor that could sing happy songs. I've never known men that could talk to God like he was their best friend and was right there beside them. I'm gonna stick around here and see what's going on. What an amazing thing. Not one of those prisoners ran for it. And the Bible says in verse number 29, then he called for a light. And who could blame a guy for wanting a cigarette at a time like that? Uh, not, 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 my wife says I got to quit saying that. But it, 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 it just, the bad part is from now on, whenever you read that chapter, you're going to think. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Listen, listen, listen. They walked through the city limits and didn't meet the man of Macedonia. And they went down to the riverside and they didn't meet the man of Macedonia. And they preached all over town for many days and they didn't meet the man of Macedonia. And God arranged an arrest and perjury and a beating and humiliation and a thrusting into the, into the depths of a dungeon to bring them face to face with the man of Macedonia. And what I want to know is, what is it that's going to make you quit? It won't be the lies. It won't be the humiliation. It won't be the disappointment. It won't be the, the dirt. It won't be the things that happened to you that you didn't think would happen. It'll be if you forget why you came to town. If you came to town to find a man of Macedonia who needs help and get that man the help, 
you will be as sure God sent you there through all your trouble as you are through all your sunshine and good times. And Paul and Silas didn't forget why they came to Philippi. Preacher, you don't know what's happened in our church. Preacher, you don't know what's happened in my life. Preacher, you don't know what I've been through. Preacher, you don't know about my finances. Preacher, you don't know about this setback I've had in my health. Here's what I do know. I know that when you got saved, you were so thrilled that you told Jesus, I'm gonna tell everybody. They didn't let it stop them. And the Bible says, he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, you know that verse from the gospel tracts, and you know that verse from the bumper stickers, and you know that verse from the, from the sermons that you've heard. But, but listen, when Paul and Silas got to Philippi, nobody there knew anything about salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, Lydia does, and some people in her house, she's probably not an inmate. Right? They didn't wait months or years. This woman, they cast the devil out of her and her handlers uh, get all this trouble stirred up and get them thrown into prison. Listen, here, here's what I believe. All my heart is what I believe. And you don't have to agree with me, but, but I think I'm right. <laughs> if this man says, what must I do to be saved? Then what do you think Paul and Silas were praying about? If this man says, what must I do to be saved? What do you think they were singing about? Don't you think those men with those loud voices were praying, Lord, would you save some sinner in this prison? Lord, would you let someone who is lost because they don't know Christ as their savior, would you let us see them saved before we leave this jail? And then he began to sing, saved by his power divine, saved through new life divine. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved. Say, why would he ask what must I do to be saved having never heard the word saved? They came to town to see people saved and in the prison with all that had happened to them, they are praying for God to save souls. And they're so thrilled about being saved that even with everything that's happened to them, they're still singing praise to God, thanking him for saving them. Can I say to you tonight, if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, he'll give you a song that'll, that'll last when the beatings come and the humiliation comes and the lies come and the bad times come and the dark nights come. We're not, this, I'm not one of those, those phony uh, TV preachers who tells you everything's gonna be great if you just come to Jesus. Nobody's mailing me $5 million. Anybody could say that if I get <laughs> half a million in the mail every day. No, you're gonna have life just like everybody else has life. There'll be a joy with it and a peace with it and a hope with it and a contentment with it and a satisfaction with it that'll keep you singing and keep you praying right through it all where everybody else around you is falling apart. Praise the Lord. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not just you to work for anybody and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house, he took them home with him. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. When the sun set, listen, when the sun set, two men that wanted to help a man of Macedonia were whipped beaten, bruised, shamed, lied about, and chained to a prison floor. And before the sun came up the next morning, they were saying, my brother, in the name of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Sister, come on over here with your husband. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the... 
they didn't forget why they came to Philippi. You've been through some hard times, who hasn't? Things didn't go the way you thought they would, join the club. I'm not making light of your troubles, but I'm telling you, you're in that hospital because that nurse needs Jesus. I'm telling you, you broke down beside the road so that guy comes to help change your tire. He needs Jesus. I'm telling you, there's trouble and problems in your life so we can show the world that we have something greater that can sustain us and keep us singing and praying and, and, and praising God when life does what life does. And because they were sure God sent them there and sure there was a man there that wanted to know Jesus, they kept going until they found that man. And he got saved. And it turned out to be bigger than they thought. His whole family got saved. And the Bible says in verse 34, and when he brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now I'll show you one more thing tonight. When it was day, the magistrates, remember those guys? sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go now, therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, let them come themselves and fetch us out. <laughs> Here's why I read you that. What was done to Paul and Silas shouldn't have happened. They could have gone to God and said, God, this isn't right. God, this isn't fair. God, the government is mistreating us. God, these, these powers that be, they're oppressing us and it's not just, it's not right. We need to fight the system. They were unjustly arrested. They were jailed without a trial. They were beaten without cause. They didn't come to town to get a key to the city. They didn't come to town to get elected to the council. They came to town to find somebody that needed Jesus. And they took whatever the world threw at them and just kept praying for souls to be saved and kept singing praise to God, looking for someone somewhere who would say, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Can I say to you tonight, and then we'll pray together. Can I say to you tonight, whatever side of the aisle you're on, we could probably talk until midnight about what's wrong with our country and our government. I can say to you tonight that, that whatever your, your position is on shots or masks or lockdowns or we could all say it's been a pretty weird two or three years. Whatever it is that we want to focus on out there in the world, it's not what it should be. Why are we here? Why are we here? Because that Republican and that Democrat and that rich man and that poor man and that white man and that black man need Jesus Christ. And if I change their politics and change their finances and, and change their views on life and, and, get, and get them to get a shot or not get a shot, and I never tell them what they must do to be saved, I forgot, listen church, I forgot why God sent me to the town in which I live. The internet's a distraction. The news channels are a distraction. Your, your access to news and information is a distraction because it'll get you to focus on your beatings and your false accusations and oppressive government and all the people that are doing things wrong and before long, everybody at work knows your political views, but they still don't know how to be saved. And everybody in your neighborhood knows who you vote for. And everybody in your neighborhood knows whether you like Fauci or don't like Fauci, but they don't know how to be saved. 
And Paul and Silas were badly treated. They weren't given the honor a citizen deserved. But they set all that aside because they'd come to Philippi not to fix the city, but to find a man who needed help and tell him about Jesus. Do you remember the time, you remember the time when you never walked by the track rack without taking some more because you'd given out all you had? What happened? Do you remember the time when the preacher, if he couldn't count on anybody else, he could count on you to be there for visitation? What happened? Do you remember when you used to pray naming your friends, naming your relatives, and pleading with God to save them. What happened? Was it a misunderstanding? Was it a lie? Was it a humiliating experience? Was it a bad time that you, you didn't think God should have allowed? Maybe tonight, maybe tonight, we need to go back and say, God, help me remember how sure I was that you wanted me to find a man of Macedonia and help him. And tonight, if you're not saved, how could you say it's not important if God would take two well-educated men and take them away from their jobs and away from their careers and away from their families and send them to a town to get treated like this just so one man working in a prison didn't have to go to hell. That's how important your soul is to the living God. He would let Christians go through anything and everything just to get a chance to tell you that Jesus Christ could save your soul if you believe on him. That's how important it is. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight as we just take a few minutes to ponder these, these things before we dismiss and get back on with our lives. I pray, Lord, for every saved man and woman in this place tonight. No, no doubt, no doubt, all but a few of us have allowed things that have happened in our lives to rob us of the zeal for souls that once was ours. Father, could we at least admit that tonight and ask you to help us with it? And Lord, if there's someone here tonight, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, never, never have they done what this jailer did. Call on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of their soul. I pray, God, you would help them tonight to see the importance to believe the gospel and trust Jesus before they leave this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The musicians coming. We'll just play a little bit on the piano and uh, let's, let's, let's pray. If you'd like to come and kneel and pray, you're welcome to do that. You want to pray where you are, let's do that. But let's, let's ask the Lord to finish this message in our hearts tonight and then the pastor will come and, and close things out for us.